welcome to everybody that's here. I appreciate your coming out in the snow. Um, they had about 59 people signed up for this presentation, so I have lots of extra handouts. That means if you take four or five home with you, that would be just fine with me. Um, I do have a handout that I brought along to um, help illustrate what I'm doing today. And if you could hand those out on that side and some on this side. As it turns out today at the, uh, the program, uh, the competing event that's going on in Fernando Foco is about food trucks. So somehow when I was trying to pick an example of a fundraising project, I zeroed in on food trucks because it seemed like an easier thing to talk about. So we're going to use that as an example as I go through today. Uh, but um, I'm here to talk about raising capital. Uh, that's what I do. I'll get into more depth about that. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of people are still debating on whether or not we're in a recession. And I will just tell you that even though the general economy may yet not yet meet most people's definition of recession, uh, in the capital industry, uh, the source of capital for businesses who are looking to raise capital, we technically raised, uh, entered this in February of last year. So over a year ago, uh, we started seeing people change their investment decisions, start pulling back from investments, start quitting, making new investments, uh, and this is compounded through the end of last year into this year. And as a consequence, if you're out raising money today, it's far more difficult to raise money than it was a year ago. And, and so I'm going to emphasize some of those points in my presentation today. And uh, if you have a specific <coughs> question on that, uh, feel free to raise your hand or ask a question at any time, because uh, there's no assurance we'll get it answered during the course of the presentation. But I am going over to the exhibit hall afterwards and be available over there for anybody who wants to ask more in-depth questions, get very granular on their specific situation. So with that, this is me in front of a brick wall down in Denver. And um, it was not prior to an execution, so that, you know, <laughs> we just picked that because it was the closest thing we could work with. I've been doing startup businesses for 44 years. And uh, I started wearing a lawyer hat, been doing a lot of high-tech startups. And then after 20 years of being the person in the back seat of the car trying to tell the driver where to go, I thought I'd be smart enough to get into the front seat and drive the car myself. Uh, that is a now 24-year-old experiment, which hasn't proven totally out. So uh, don't worry about that. But along the path, I've been involved in raising capital for hundreds of businesses, clients, projects of mine, community, things, uh, charities, and so forth. I haven't seen it all because I know now that I'll never learn everything I can learn about raising capital, but I've learned more than most people will ever want to learn, and I'm here to try to share some of my <coughs> thoughts and process and how I go about doing that with everyone. So with that, um, we get into Founded in Foco. We are here to help businesses be successful, to start, to grow, to thrive, and one of the things that is challenging for most businesses is a lack of resources. You typically start your whole process where you put together your business plan around an idea, around an opportunity, and you roll it all out, and you get to the end of the business plan, and you say, I need so much resources to do everything I want to do in the plan, and there is a difference between what you have and what you need, and that's where the question of raising capital comes into question. Who do I raise money from? How much money do I need? How am I going to spend the money? All these other questions. And so we're going to try to help you frame some of that here today. So during a recession, as I was saying, there are fewer dollars. And um, this is a quote just this week from Fannie Mae from uh, talking about where we're at. And uh, Fannie Mae I work with because of the fact that I do work in the housing area as one of many different industries I work with. And this is their quote. We will have a recession. If you don't agree with this today, just wait. It'll come. And the more important <coughs> problem that we're looking at is it says, we view a soft landing, though possible, as highly unlikely. So let me explain to you what that means to me. It means that the feds, who are not getting inflation under control, are going to continue to increase interest rates. That means the price of money will go up, and any of you who are seeking to raise money will need to pay for the price of that money. And that means that a number of projects that might have been viable a year ago 
may not be viable today because the cost of money puts it over the top. They won't pencil, they won't go that direction. The problem is, as the feds raise the rates, you'll see fewer and fewer projects that can meet this cost of money threshold. And so you'll see less business starting, less business growing, you'll see projects reversing. You may have seen in the paper last week that five landlords or apartments in Denver turned the keys over to their lenders. They had gone upside down in their math model, and as a consequence, they had to close their doors. Uh, many, many industries, you're gonna see businesses stopping, pausing, freezing, and then going backwards, where the bank is going, we're not comfortable any longer, or we are required by the Fed to maintain certain ratios in our accounts between what we consider zero risk and no risk, um, and uh, it is a difference in the banks. And they will call the companies who are paying the bills on time and go, we're sorry, but we want you to pay all your loan off now. We need more cash in our account to meet the Fed's requirement, even though that wasn't what we agreed to, it's actually in the fine print of your loan agreement, so give us all your money now so we look better, but it puts the business in a position where they cannot go forward, and if they're dependent upon ongoing loan money, now they're in trouble, and this creates what we call an economic cascade. You have one domino tip over, not so bad, but it hits another domino, and that may hit three dominoes, and the next thing you know, we have businesses failing everywhere, and we start looking like we did back in 2008, 2009, and during this entire time, the availability of cash, of money, of capital resources is getting smaller, it's getting more expensive, and the bar that you have to meet in order to get financing uh, is getting higher, higher, and higher. Uh, it's very common in the industry we talk about, you need about a 20% equity to debt ratio, meaning you create a capital stack that has two types of capital. We're gonna have private investors putting money in at a high risk, that's called the equity portion. Then we have a bank or financial institution put in 80%, which is mortgage financing, equipment financing, some other form of debt. That ratio is a very common one, but during a recession, it's not 2080. It then becomes 3070, 4060, 5050, and then it becomes something that you really don't even wanna talk about because you might as well have all the money in equity if you can get it. At the same time, you will find that investors who have the discretion not to participate in the capital market right now, meaning they can go to the sidelines, sit still, and watch everything take place like a, a, a fan at a sports event, they will do that. Uh, they call this keeping their powder dry. That's a phrase used in the capital industry that says, I'm not doing anything today because I don't have to. I'm safe or better off to wait till this chaos ends until the market stabilize, and then I'll come back into the market and make investments. So this means that a lot of money that would ordinarily be moving around in the capital industry is not moving right now. And even if you do find them, uh, they're gonna put you through a longer due diligence period, and then they're gonna start asking for things you may not be able to supply. Uh, going through this series of questions that you know inevitably is gonna lead to a no uh, with a particular source of capital, is not something most people look forward to. I try to set my quote at no more than four no's a day mm -hmm. as I'm working on raising capital because that's about <coughs> all the patience I have for, for talking to people. I'm also kind of blaming myself. I'm talking to the wrong people, which is what I want to get to today in higher detail. So um, professional capital raising. Uh, if you think about this as an activity, if you think of it as a sport, that this is something that people are going to do and they're going to achieve excellence, they're gonna to try to get that Olympic gold medal. If you're raising capital, you wanna do it in the shortest period of time at the least cost. Because what you're doing while you're raising capital is you're not running your business. And if you're not running your business, you're putting that business at risk, you're causing a higher probability of failure, so you wanna get in and get out. I talk about a SEAL team or a Delta team, uh, they're in and out, nobody knows it happened, the capital wasn't there yesterday, it's here today, Good for us, let's move forward. One of the things though is that you'll find that if you're really, really good at this, and this is getting you into that gold medal status, is as you're raising capital correctly, you're lowering the price of money. Meaning that the price you're paying, if it would have been a 10% interest on a loan, you get it for eight. If you're gonna give up 20% of your company in equity to get the capital in the door, you're gonna lower it to 18 or 15 or 10 or something like that. And so this is all part of an elegance or a sophistication in raising capital uh, that is achievable if you take it on as an activity 
and you don't make a lot of assumptions, and you don't watch Start Tank. So I just, I made that cut, so that we're, we're done with that. So, in the motivated money approach, we don't want to talk to all the usual people. We don't believe in talking to people who have money in their pocket just because they have money in their pocket. Because statistically, if you look at angel financing, regardless of form, whether it's the local angel club, it's angel list, anything that's out there, 98% of the applications for funding to angels get turned down. Now, if, even if you're playing for the Rockies and you're at bat and you're batting 105, that's better than a 2%, okay, that you would get talking to an angel. So we're saying that we want to improve the probability of success. We want to do this, uh, and we want to do it in a way where we're not just talking to people about a single reason to invest, which is a return on that investment. We want to expand our horizons and move to a larger group. So uh, I mentioned the retreat. This is ongoing, and, and this is a, an unfortunate situation, but if you've been in the industry through four decades as I have, this is my fourth recession. I'm going through it, I understand it. We just have to make adjustments. And we have to know and get our expectations in line that a lot of money that might have been there yesterday won't be there today, and so let's move on. So my method, the one that I work with my clients in my own projects, is called the motivated money because I'm looking for those people who have the greatest self-interest, the greatest motivation to make their capital available to me or my project today. And um, this is something that remains viable during a recession because these sources of funding are also going to have to stay in the capital industry because they, like you, need to keep moving forward. They don't have the discretion, as a rule, to step outside, to sit down, to wait out the recession and see what happens on the other side. So the fundamental point of my method of raising capital is to work with what I call stakeholders. So stakeholders are people who will benefit from the success of your organization with or without making an investment. So out of the entire world out there, of all the people on the planet, of all the companies, businesses, organizations, uh, there's a lot of people with money. There's lots of millionaires, billionaires, whatever you want to call them, but they have no interest in you or what you're doing. There's nothing you can do to change that. And if you spend all your time talking to people who don't know, don't care about you, you are wasting your time. And that does not make you a gold medal winner in the category of raising capital. But stakeholders do care about you because your success somehow is translating to their success. And if we look at this chart of stakeholders, and this is a very common chart, it doesn't matter which chart you're using, uh, right now I know that my customers are gonna benefit from my success because they're getting my product or service, it's addressing a problem they may have, and it's making the problem less or go away and I get a complete cure. If I go in my supply chain, which is the easiest place to identify a stakeholder, this is everyone who's selling you products or services that you use in your business to either make your products or services or to contribute to your products or services, and they want you to succeed. It's a very simple formula. If you grow, they grow. If you make more money, more profits from selling your products or services, you're gonna buy more products or services from them, and so they want you to succeed. In fact, they may fall over themselves to help you succeed. In my entire four decades plus of raising capital, the only time I got a check the same day I made my first pitch was when we were talking to a supplier to an electronic widget, and they'd had a relationship for about two and a half years. And in that particular setting, uh, we went to talk to the supplier. I was with him that day to help speak for him because speaking was not one of his best talents. And the guy says, what do you want? I said, we want $200,000. He says, why would I give that to you? And I said, well, how much product did you sell last year to this company? He says, no, I sold maybe around $300,000 last year. I said, what was your profit margin? And I said, no, I already know. It was like 43%. I won't tell you where I got that information, but let's just say my spies were active in your organization over the last couple of weeks. I now know exactly how much profit you made out of selling product to this company. He says, yeah, so go on. I said, with the $200,000, we think we can increase purchases from your company in the next year 
to somewhere around a mil, mil and a half. And the guy says, okay. I said, multiply that by 43%. He goes, yeah. She says, so I'll be making more money by selling you more products. He goes, yes, yeah, I get it. He says, hold on a moment. He goes back to his office, brings out the checkbook, wrote us a check for $200,000 and said, go for it. So that was the only time I've gotten through this entire cycle in a hurry because the self-interest, the dollar amount, everything was obvious to someone who was a stakeholder. Now, stakeholders take all shapes, sizes, and forms. And I believe the next thing is that when you start saying, well, what is the benefit to a stakeholder? This is how we start identifying, determining, quantifying, qualifying people as stakeholders. They can take all shapes, sizes, and forms. If this guy works for your company, he has a job, he's a stakeholder. Because of the fact he gets payroll, gets check, gets benefits, and he continues working for you. You say, well, how can he invest in my company? Well, if his market value is 65000 a year, and he agrees to take salary at 40000 a year, and 25000 of that goes into stock in your company, he has made an investment in your company, and he has reduced the amount of cash that you have to raise from someone else. So you have, in fact, completed an investment within your own employee ranks. If we come over here to job creation, you go into any community right now and you ask the head of economic development, do you need more jobs in your community? The answer is invariably yes. Do you want more high paying jobs? More so. Can we bring in, in fact, bring a factory here and have lots of jobs? Oh yes, they're going to sing, dance, roll out the red carpet, do anything for you. So if you go into a community, they become a stakeholder because of a variety of different things or consequences that occur from that investment. If they give you money and you locate in their community, you're creating new jobs. Those jobs result in more taxes. You're going to have sales tax, you're going to have income tax that is collected by the local government that pays for libraries like this one, uh, educational institutions like this one. I was in a library yesterday in Southern Colorado, so I was like, I'm in the library two days in a row. I've got to figure out what's going on here. But, um, uh, they make all these taxes paid for police, roads, those kinds of things. They need jobs in order to do that. So they want jobs in the community. And if you go to a community and say, I'm going to create even 10 new jobs, particularly in a rural community, that's home run ter territory for them. They want you to be there. They want to work with you to make that happen. So they may roll out an economic development grant. They may waive fees for different things that you're going to do. Uh, they may help you with real estate acquisition, they may give you services. Everything that you don't have to pay for is a form of investment that comes back to benefit you and reduces the amount of cash that you would otherwise have to raise. Um, we could go through all the stakeholders like I did before. We can talk about common causes. If your product or service improves the planet, reduces environmental problems, is energy conservation, power generation, uh, then you will find affinity with Sierra Club, different types of economic groups. Uh, I was talking with a group this morning uh, where in California, iBank is providing debt financing to anything that improves the environment up to an 8% guarantee on that particular thing because we've brought in Harmony, a new business, and a social cause and brought them together, which makes the capital available. So we look at these benefits and what we typically do is we say, okay, here's everybody that benefits. We'll break them into groups. I call it stakeholder profiling, similar to the FBI. I'm gonna break everybody into groups who's a beneficiary. I'm gonna determine what kind of benefit it is. I'm gonna quantify, qualify it as much as I can. And then I wanna create my priority list. I wanna to talk to the top 10 people who are most likely to invest because they have the greatest benefit that's gonna come out of that particular investment. And that is my priorities as I was describing here. Um, part of the thing that we see, and it's a common error, is there's a tendency for entrepreneurs to talk to anybody who has money. And as I said, if you're, they're not going to invest, then that's a waste of your time. You just might meet some new people, might join a lunch club, have a real nice chat over lunch, but that's not putting the capital in your hands where you need it. So I wanna to talk to those who are interested. And I don't need, and this is one of my rules, I don't need everybody to invest. I just need enough people to invest to meet my capital goal. 
if I get to my capital goal, I'm done, I go back to work, I don't have to raise money any longer. And since I've already determined that the shortest distance you know, to getting back to work is to complete my capital campaign, I want to make this as short as possible. And so I create my top 10 list, and if that top 10 list gets me my funding, I'm done, I go home. I don't need to talk to tens of people, I don't need to do pitch competitions, I don't need to go on Shark Tank, I don't need to do any of those things. So with that, you put together your capital <coughs> campaign plan. You say, now that I know who I'm going to talk to, I can do a number of things within this plan. First, I'm gonna structure my offering to the person that I wanna to talk to. Instead of creating a generic one size fits all, in fact, you see entrepreneurs commonly doing, I'm gonna give up 20% of my company you know, for $50,000, $100,000, $250,000. That offering by itself is so generic, it's supposed to make, you know, it's supposed to not, you know, cause anybody to have problems with you. They're gonna go, yeah, okay, I'm not offended by your offering. They're also not excited by your offering, and you're stuck at this point in time. Again, going back to common investors, and I, I work with angels all the time, but I typically put them down on my list because they only have one reason to invest, and that's the return, I want to talk to someone who's going to get that extra benefit from being a stakeholder. But if I'm standing at the front of the room and I tell you my offer is I'm going to get you a 10% annualized rate of return on the investment you make in my company, and then you stand up and come over here and say, you say the same thing. For my company, I can offer you a deal and I can also offer you 10%. Everybody in the room can offer you 10%. Well, from the investor standpoint, you're all commodity at this point. You all look alike. Even though you're unique and your business is unique and your position, your life cycle is unique and everything is unique, to the investor, you're all the same. So what happens at that point? They start engaging in their own profiling. They're going like, do I know you? Uh, did I meet you at a club last week? Did we have a drink together two years ago? The slightest connection may make all the difference. And it's not necessarily rational. It's not necessarily repeatable. And so it can't really be part of a process. It can't be part of a method because there's no continuity or repeatability to it. So when I do the capital campaign, now that I know who to talk to, I'm gonna create my offer targeted to them. I can actually sometimes with stakeholders tweak an offer and I could have three, four, or five offers all at the same time in the same capital campaign targeted at different stakeholders and I can turn up the dial and create amplification of that benefit to that particular stakeholder. I can even customize it for a particular individual or, or business. And because of that, it changes the tenor of the conversation. I'm no longer saying, I need money, I'm an entrepreneur, I expect to be funded, you know, please throw money at me. I'm going out to them and saying, I have something that's going to benefit you. I don't know exactly how much it is, but I think you're going to benefit in this manner. Let's talk about it. Well, that's an open door to any kind of conversation you want to have with an investor candidate because you're talking about them, not about you. You're talking about how you're going to make your business a contributor to their mission, their story, their organization, and how you're going to succeed with them. And that makes all the difference in how they're going to talk with you, how you're going to build a relationship with them. Your true goal is not necessarily to get money into your hands. That's simply a milestone along the path. You're building relationships with people who have resources, who have commonality, have an affinity, and over time and over the life of your organization, these are people that you may have a, a relationship for the remainder of the life of the company or your own life. Uh, when you think about it, if somebody invests in your company and there's never a cash exit where they get their money back, uh, they're just taking uh, distributions to an LLC or partnership, this may be a lifetime relationship. Are you thinking about what you're doing when you're raising capital, saying, is this person I really somebody I want to get married to for the rest of my life and work with them and get resources <coughs> from them, or not? Because a number of people that commonly are known to hand out checks are not necessarily the people you would ordinarily socialize with because they may not be somebody you like. They may not care about what you're doing. Um, they may be there simply to make money, get in and get out. And if you have no other choice, it isn't like I'm telling you to turn them down, but I certainly don't want to put them high on my list of people to get money from. So with this in place, I also, as I was mentioning earlier, capital, which is what you're trying to raise, 
is not limited to the definition of cash. We all kind of default to cash, say the only thing I'm gonna raise is cash. And when you do that, you've narrowed greatly who may be able to give you what you need. Uh, because that means that somebody's got cash sitting idle, not at work, that's there at the time you're looking for money, and, and people who really work their money hard, that money's never sitting idle, so they're out of the picture. Uh, if it turns out that they don't have a lot of cash, they can't help you, but they could help you with one of these things that you need. If you think about it, when you put together your offering memorandum, you will commonly say, if I got $100,000, this is what I'm gonna spend it on. It's broken out like a recipe for a cake. I'm gonna spend so much on this, so much on this, and so much on this. Well, this is your recipe list. And you will find out that if you go to someone who has something that's on your recipe list, you might be able to strike a deal directly without having to go to the trouble of raising cash to spend cash, you just go get what you need. So over here, I might find somebody who has intellectual property uh, that I want to bring into a portfolio that I'm putting together, and rather than me going raising money from someone who doesn't know me and doesn't care about me, who only wants to get a rate return, I might find that this person will give me that same IP for stock in my company. I've essentially created a shortcut to get to that same resource. And it, 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 we'll find out that very commonly that pricing is lower for whatever it's going to be than if I had to go the other route. Not counting the cost of raising capital, but just the price of money itself will be lower because we have something to do. Uh, facilities comes up all the time. You'll find somebody says, well, I need so much space. I need to buy a building, build a building. I go, but look at all the empty space out there. What if we find somebody who's a landlord who isn't leasing it out to a tenant at the moment? What if I could get them to give it to me for you know, a lesser fee or for stock or for something in the future? I've created an investment, I've got what I needed, I can go home, my job is done, I probably got it at a lower price. So keep in mind as you're framing this, not only are we not looking to people who just have cash, we're looking to people who have any resource that we need that's on our shopping list, on our use of proceeds, and we're gonna think about what kind of deal can we cut with them that will get me what I need, will get some what they need. And particularly if it's an underutilized or unused asset where it's been sitting idle for six months, the deal just gets sweeter, quicker, better when you put that together. So that gets me through my presentation for the moment. I just point out to you a resource that you may have, want to check on. We built an artificial intelligence agent called the Entrepreneur Pro. Uh, this is available at this address. And you can ask it any question about entrepreneurship you want. And we're training it up specifically to answer questions on raising capital. And it's there 24 by 7. Uh, we're in the process of continuing to train it. It's a perpetual thing. Um, it's about two years old, and we've been laughing. It sometimes acts like a two-year-old. You sometimes get an artificial intelligence to do things you don't want it to do. And, um, and it can be embarrassing at times. But nonetheless, uh, this is a resource for you uh, to add to your portfolio, the tools in your toolbox. Um, another thing is I do a podcast. We're up to 21, 22 episodes now. We started in September of last year. This is a weekly uh, interview with entrepreneurs, experts in raising capital, different types of things in operating your business. And this is free. And we typically will bring people on and we'll have like a lesson, something, some point of raising capital within the motivated money method that we try to get across. So this is here to help you uh, also learn, learn from others, see what others are doing, and get some of this. And uh, you, this is basically the YouTube. If you put in Motivated Money Podcast, Dakin, uh, the keyword search will find it. Uh, and the slide deck, we're going to try to make sure that you get it, and it will be on the video. So one way or another, we're going to you know, get you this link. Um, I do a boot camp. Uh, this is a short commercial pitch. I put on a boot camp four times a year. It's 10 and a half. It's 10 weeks, 25 hours, and uh, the next one starts on April 19th. And this is a very, what we call a sprint. Uh, you're gonna get the fire hose out, you're gonna learn about raising capital in a hurry, and uh, get you to that point. And again, you can find more information on that. So that brings me uh, to some other contacts information if you wanna get a hold of me, email, phone number, uh, a couple different URL listings, and I want to then, uh, and this is where this 
folder is currently stored. So if you want the slide deck for today, and you can remember that, I'm going to get for you. Uh, I would I recommend that, that you do that, but I'm going to try to get it into the schedule. For whatever reason, the schedule for Founded and Foco did not like me to upload documents to it. And after multiple attempts, this is the best I could do. Um, so as we're closing here, um, this is the handout I gave you everybody. And I'm going to walk through this very quickly to kind of illustrate my point. Um, I'm working uh, with a group in Denver called CrowdSprout. They're opening up a new interstate crowdfunding platform uh, that's limited for investment to residents of the state of Colorado. It's also limited to businesses that are going to be part of a new food evolving food chain in Colorado, where we're going to try to help anyone who does anything from a farmer to a finished product, anybody who's a restaurant, uh, can go to this group and, and find funding from the crowd, from people in Colorado. We're just getting started. We're hoping to launch this first campaign next week, and it's going to be for this company, Buenos Nachos. Now, Buenos Nachos is, in some ways, very, very typical of businesses that need money. They're not even a year old. They had a successful first year running a food truck in the Denver metro area, and now they're interested in buying a second food truck and doubling their size. But if you go to any classical investor and have them look at the books and records of this company, you would not invest. It's not investable from a return on investment standpoint. Okay, so right there, we've discounted a huge section of the capital industry are ineligible. They won't play in this game. So what do we do? Well, we thought through this, we did analysis of who are their stakeholders. They actually only have one. It's their customers. These are the people who are buying nachos, enchiladas, and nacharitos from this truck somewhere in the Denver area. And um, we're like, well, how do we craft an offering, a proposal for funding that will get us where we want to go? Well, a lot of crowdfunding platforms, and I am in disagreement with most of them, are keep trying to convert customers into investors and ask them to engage in investment as an investor instead of as a customer. I go, no, no, that's not going to work. These people don't think of themselves as investors. They're not going to act like investors. They're not going to decide. I need to give them a customer deal, which we call here the super deal. So for $100 in our deal, a person's going to get four large nacho servings, with $64 value for free for 100 bucks. Then they get a VIP customer card, which gives them 20% off any purchase through the end of this year. We've estimated that if they go back to the truck three, four, five times, this is a $200 value to them, and that's what they get to start with, free food and discounts on other food purchases. Now, to someone who's just put $100 on the table, getting $64 back is okay, but that's not necessarily going to get us out of bed in the morning. But potentially getting 20% off all year long, I could even have them come to my family party and get 20% off the entire event. I could have them sit outside my craft brewery and have all my customers get 20% off. There's all kinds of people who now become indirect stakeholders to this group because they can serve food at an event or at your business or at something else, and the customers are overlapping between the two, and all these customers are getting 20% off now they're getting great value for 100 bucks. Well, beyond that, we are going to give them ownership in the company. We're going to give up 10% ownership in this food truck, which on its own, good or bad, I'm not going to give it any points for what the return is going to be on this. But because they do have an ownership in this, they become part of our family. They become part of our <coughs> advocacy. They become the evangelist for our food truck and if they're out getting ready to go buy food from a food truck, and there's four food trucks lined up, and ours is one of them, I can tell you the odds just increase. They're going to buy food from our food truck instead of one of the other food trucks. And this is called customer loyalty. And this relationship will go on for a long time because there is no planned cash exit from this investment because we're not sure how that's going to be accomplished. So we didn't even pitch it that way. But what we've done is we've taken a common style investment of $100, and instead of saying, hey, you're going to get rich, or it's going to be fabulous, or we're going to scale the moon, or all these other stories which are questionably believable, 
what we are going to do is we're going to give you some immediate value. We're going to put the control back in your hands as the investor because you can get food. All you got to do is go down tomorrow and you get $64 worth of food. You can go down all year long and pick up another couple hundred dollars of value of food that you would have bought anyway. So it isn't changing your buying decision except who you may be buying it from. And now you're ahead of the game. Now, if there is any payback, if there's any cash distribution from this as an LLC, as a member in this particular company, that's icing on the cake. That's over the top. And we've done this. Now we've taken what would otherwise be an un... It's a company you can't invest in. It's not investable by any common definition. And we've identified stakeholders who care enough about this company that they may put the money out there. We need 250 people to put in $100 a piece, which allows us to buy a used truck that we already know about and place it in a food court of other food trucks. And this company will have doubled in size here very soon. Uh, and we've done it because we focused on stakeholders, we focused on value, we were creative in how we structured our offering, and by doing that, we can raise money. Now, on a grand scale, this also applies to companies raising $500,000, million dollars, $5 million. At some point, <coughs> there is really no limit on this. Uh, many companies I've talked to over the last couple of weeks are out talking about raising half a million to five million, which is kind of the, what they call the death valley of raising capital, because you've exhausted your friends and family, and you're not yet large enough, old enough, mature enough, or profitable enough to be attractive to financial institutions, so what are you gonna do? This approach, the myth, uh, motivated money approach, focused on stakeholders, is one way to improve your odds of being successful in your capital campaign, and it is something you can do yourself. It isn't really that complicated. I keep trying to explain to people, this is marketing 101. It's actually maybe marketing one. Uh, if you go out to sell your products or services, you don't assume everybody's gonna buy it. Whatever characteristics or features of your product are there, there's this group who's most likely to buy, and that's who you wanna focus on when you start your business. When you come into investing, for whatever reason, I think it's because people watch Shark Tank too much, they lose their entire IQ on marketing, and they, they go out and they market to everybody. They put out something so generic, so bland, so undesirable that nobody's gonna invest in it anyway, but at the same time, they're making themselves look like everybody else. It's like intentionally becoming a commodity when they should be doing something more. So uh, as a result of that, you know, what basically I'm, I'm hoping you all see from this proposal is that there's a different way to raise capital. There are people who are more likely than less likely to invest. They have a reason to invest. If you can figure out who it is and you talk to them and they understand how they're benefiting from your success, you will have a variety of relationships that may come out of this immediately. Uh, they may already know your industry better than you do. They may have resources you need that you can get at a lower cost than going through the more elaborate, more costly process of raising capital through angels or financial institutions. And so that's basically what I want to leave you with. I've got five minutes left before Ben's going to kick me out of the room. I will go over to the exhibit hall afterwards. Uh, but yeah, any quick questions here uh, as we get done today? Yes, Ben. So in this example, if you had, um, if you want to raise 25,000, you would need 250 people to put in $100 each. Yes. So then that's 10% of your company value that you're giving over in exchange for that. Well, it's 10% of the company. I'm very, I'm very concerned about saying 10% of company value because I'm not necessarily assigning a value to the company. But, um, but yeah, it's 250 people. Now, a lot of people go, I don't want 250 people, but I'm in this crowdfunding thing, I actually have framed this to be more of a marketing effort than it is a funding effort. I want more customers. More customers mean my success. Uh, we're getting ready to do one for Splish Naturals, which is a topical pain relief thing that includes CBD. Uh, we might, uh, if we optimize our, our campaign, we might have 3,500 new investors slash customers, okay? Now, instead of me having to spend money on marketing, I got them through my crowdfunding campaign. Well, beyond that, we also, what we try to do is what we call the trifecta. Once they become a customer and an investor, I want to make them an evangelist for my company. I'm going to give them incentives to go out and tell everybody in their networks about what we're doing and brag up on it. Okay, now I have three hats they're wearing. They're a customer, they're an investor, and they're an evangelist. 
if I have a relationship that's that effective, that efficient, I'm going to do a lot of good things. And instead of spending all my time talking to people who may not know, may not care, and trying to get them educated, I'm talking to people who are using the product, who see the product, they're going, wow, okay, this is good. Okay, so they get the value as a customer, but they, and we do it at two levels. One is the user, and one is a reseller. Uh, we give them discounts. We're gonna give them other things. We're actually, on this one, we're engineering a new stakeholder. We're gonna give boxes of products away to the hero of your choice if you make a certain dollar investment. So we're bringing in another class of stakeholders who didn't exist naturally, and we're profiling them and, and promoting them because it brings back and tells our story better than it would have been otherwise. So, other than Ben, anybody question? So you don't actually need to do the legal form of uh, being a stockholder for the company? You don't have to be a stockholder. Uh, you're familiar with Kickstarter and Indiegogo where they do rewards only campaigns. It's a form of crowdfunding where you're not giving away equity, so it's no longer a sale of security. But you are bringing in new customers, and you may do it at discount, or you may even charge a premium price, depends on how cool your stuff is. And, and you're bringing in money. Any form of money is good. Actually, you know, I will tell people revenue with profits is your best form of capital you can get. Having to give money away to, in order to get money in the door is a lesser choice between the two. And any time I can create a capital combination where I'm selling product at the same time I'm raising capital, I'm just advancing my company ever that much faster. And in this case, is this a securities? It is. So this is a sales security. It falls under the Colorado Crowdfunding Act, okay. uh, interstate rules. It's a small business offering, which is 500000 or less. So we don't have to have an intermediary and some of the other baggage that goes along with that. It's an all or nothing campaign, so we don't have to have an escrow agent. And it's the simplest, cheapest form of raising capital that we can make. It doesn't have to be qualified investors because of the crowdfunding? Yeah, this is for any investor as long as they're a resident of the state of Colorado. Accredited, non-accredited, both can do it. Yeah. There are cash limits. You can only make a $5,000 investment if you're a non-accredited investor. Uh, but we're not expecting anybody to do that. If somebody walks in and offers the whole $25,000 and they're accredited, we're done here. I'm going to go home. And um, we're gonna have some nachos. So, yeah, it's all good. Other quick questions before uh, we're out of time? Yes? So we don't need to raise our prices in order to cut that, uh, what we're giving? Well, think of it this way. Um, you say, um, right now, I'm gonna go raise capital. I wanna give up part of my future profits. Okay, that's what a common equity offering is, uh, where you're saying, I'm going to give you part of my stock, then in the future, that stock gives you a share of future profits. Well, right now, today, in your product or your service, you have a profit margin between your cost and what you're selling it for at retail. We can take part of that profit, and we can create discounts today, which we can build into our proposal to an investor. And that means that we've got more range to work with than we might otherwise. Um, and so with that, we've got a little more creativity, a little more range of motion on what kind of deal I can put together to make that happen. That still is a cost of raising capital. If I give up a dollar in discounts in order to raise a dollar, it you know, I, I'm technically zero. I'm at break even. But I'm okay sacrificing 250 customers here where I'm going to give them a super deal because it's bringing me the money to do all the other things I want to do. So I refer to it as a sacrificial investment, but I don't care that 250 people get the super deal and I didn't maximize my profit with them. I care about the fact I get a second food trailer and I'm gonna go out and sell more nachos. Yes? So you mentioned that um, you sell the people have a stake in the company because they own now 10% of it. Do they then have like decision-making power or how does that work? They do, um, and this, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify that. In this case, no, they don't. Okay. They have an ownership position, but we're only selling non-voting memberships in the LLC. <coughs> that is a requirement of the crowdfunding platform because they wanted to keep everything the same. I'm open to going either way. It wouldn't really matter, but as a 10% owner, they're a minority. 
which means any vote that comes up, the majority, which is Tracy and Dennis, who own the company, can say, no, I don't think that's a good idea, or yes, thank you very much for the idea. You really want to use your investors as um, uh, what I call a network of people who can come in and help you expand upon what you're doing, everything. Uh, so many people fail to use their investors as a valuable resource. Uh, you know, who do you know? Who can help me? I'm looking for this, that kind of a thing. So, uh, yeah, voting is important in some cases, but typically not in this type of crowdfunding. Um, I, I have people who say, well, I, don't, I want a seat on the board because I put money in. I go, that's the worst reason you can give me. <laughs> in fact, the fact you put it on the table, I appreciate your asking, but I'm probably going to say no, just automatically knee-jerk reaction to that. I want people on my board who are the best and brightest, you know, the dream team that I can put around me, and then I like to have 10 to 20 people on my board of advisors who fill every information gap that I could ever have. So at two in the morning, I can call someone who I know who has the answer to a question that just came into my mind. Okay, so we're at the end here for the day. Um, and I'm happy to go over to the exhibit hall and answer any more questions that you have. Uh, you've got contact information up here. I have some flyers with regard to the boot camp that I'm doing. If you're interested in saturating yourself with more stuff about raising capital than you ever dreamed of, uh, and I'm okay with that because um, I'm doing uh, almost evangelical conversions where people go, this is the way you raise money. I go, no, it's not. You raise money this way. Um, and trying to get them so that they're, they're more efficient in raising their capital and hitting their goals. Um, there's, there's really not a lot of gold stars for successful capital campaigns. It took you nine months instead of three months. It, just, it doesn't work that way. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.